welcome to Word of Life. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Amen. This morning I would like to share a little thought with you. It's about the gratitude and the thankfulness that we should give to our Lord every day. Most of the time, most of us, myself included, we tend to complain about many petty things like if we get up in the morning and we have to go to work and take the kids to school and it's cold and it's raining, we tend to complain a bit. Uh, if we're stuck in traffic, we complain. If we have a dirty house to clean, we complain. If the kids are misbehaving, we complain. But what we don't realize is that we the things that we complain about are in reality God's blessings, God's gift to us. If, we, if we're stuck in traffic, it means that we have a car. We're blessed with a car. <laughs> if, we are, if we have a dirty house to clean, it means that God has provided for us a decent home to live in. If we have dirty dishes to wash, it means that God has provided food on our plate on that day and on each and every day. So, next, we will try to make an effort this week. And when we are to complain about something, think, what am I complaining about? What is this blessing that we are complaining about? And instead, we should give thanks to the Lord for that thing, because giving thanks is part of our daily worship. Worship is not just our songs with that we sing Sunday morning. It's these little things which we praise God for and thank God for every day. May you have a blessed service. Hallelujah.
uh, what we perceive in this world, in our brain. We are limited by our five senses. We can touch, we can feel, we can taste, we can see, we can hear. But uh, it's all registered in our brain. So what is reality actually? What if we had more senses? What if the senses were different? How would we perceive things if there are things in a way? But there is something which thinks, there is something which makes all this happen, and that's inside, the one who asks questions, the one who wants to see, the one who is using that body, and that is the soul. And the soul, I believe, that is in the likeness of him, our creator. The soul is in the likeness of Jesus. The soul is in the likeness of God, him who has created all these wonderful things. He is the God of wonders. Amen. He is the one who has seen our soul inside Amen. and wanted to save that soul. That important, must be so important to God that we have this soul, this spirit inside, and this body is the temple. And you can understand now that this body is a temple which is holding that soul there for him to be reunited with him whenever he will decide to call us back in his kingdom. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. You are truly the God of wonders.
Yes, Lord my God, you are the God of my salvation. You are the God of all creation. And I praise you, Lord. I want to praise you in everything that I do, Lord. I praise you in every situation of my life. I praise you at home, I praise you at work, I praise you at church, I praise you in my car, Lord. For you deserve all the praise. You deserve all the glory. You deserve all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Good morning. You look beautiful from here. Um, I, love, I love those smiles. <laughs> so, today we have Masha for the Bible reading. Jake for the prayer, and Russell as the sister. Jake, you need us to prayer. Lord, help those who are sick and couldn't come today to uh, get well, and come and pray you in your house. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 The rich and the kingdom of God. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You should know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. Ed adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is this for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a, of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who have heard this ask, who can be saved? Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So, this morning it seems like what heavy game was saying and the prayers and the songs we were singing, it's all about following Jesus. And even, we just read the story of the rich young ruler, alright? We see that he wanted to follow Jesus, but to follow Jesus will cost us something. And as Abigail was saying, I consider myself rich. And I'm sure we are all rich. Why? We drive a car, we can have warm showers, we have a warm bed, I eat three meals a day plus snacks in between, and I'm rich. But from Jesus' perspective, riches can be an obstacle, both for salvation and both for discipleship. And that's, that's what I want to focus on, obstacles in discipleship. So we are here. Because at one point or another, we made a decision to follow Jesus, right? We made a decision to follow Jesus. A musician decides to be a musician. But does that make him a musician just if he decides? What makes him a decision, Sandro? Practice. Commitment makes him a musician. And that's also for our Christian life. I can decide to follow Jesus, but that doesn't make me a Christian. I have to be committed. Alright? So, we are committed to follow Christ. There was, there's the, there was this German theologian, I think his name was Dietrich, something like that, Bonhoeffer. And he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to die. So, when we decide to follow Jesus, we are choosing death. What am I saying this morning? 
John 10, 10 says that Jesus gives us, gives us life and life in abundance. But to have life in abundance, we have to deny ourselves daily. We have to carry the cross daily. We have to crucify our desires, our lusts, our plans, our possessions. And we are choosing that. And once once we are truly following Jesus, that's when we are truly his disciples. That's when we're followers and not just fans. Because many times we act as fans. What do fans do? They go to the stadium on a Sunday, they go to the church on Sunday, cheer up, and they leave. But followers walk side by side to their master. So what are we? Are we fans or are we followers? When we made the decision, did we decide that we are going to be committed followers of Jesus Christ? Have we surrendered all to Him? Have we learned how to forgive? Do we know how not to keep any bitterness? If I have a problem with my brother, then I call him and tell him, brother, forgive me. And then it's up to them. So, man, we need to really follow Jesus. We need to start doing something, as I said last week. So, as we hold these elements in my, in my hands, as we, as we read also in the scripture, and it says, what's impossible for man? It's possible for God. And God prepared a way for us. This is available for us because He provided it for us. Amen? So, let's recommit ourselves. Let's remember what Jesus did for us on that cross. And today, this is the day of salvation. This is the day where we are going to recommit ourselves to follow Jesus and we are committed to this. So, let's see this bread together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you made a way for us. We didn't deserve it, Lord. We didn't do anything to earn it, Lord. So thank you for your precious part. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, church, what are, what are we going to do? Are we going to be just fans? Or are we going to be followers? Amen. Pastor, you can take the lead. That hurts. Praise Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm sure some of you were caught up in the marathon traffic. But thank God most of us made it here. Amen. This week, 
I was preparing for today's sermon, and uh, in my mind I had that I will continue on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But once again, as the Lord done a couple of weeks ago, while we were in our prayers on Saturday morning, a topic came up and it kept burning in my heart all day long. A topic which we slightly discussed, well, discussed it a little bit. And this is a topic of repentance which was also mentioned this morning. And also, while hearing Lauren speak, and making the difference between calling ourselves Christian or being a Christian, I think most of us, or all of us, pass through an experience of just saying, or believing one is a Christian, but in reality, the lifestyle does not match the walk with God. And I think repentance is not only something one makes the day that he or she gives his life or her life to Jesus. Repentance has to be done regularly, especially when we are being challenged whether or not our Christian life matches what the Bible says about Christianity. Amen. And therefore, today we're going to talk about repentance and the theme is Repentance, a visible proof of a born-again experience. So let's think a little bit about this theme. Repentance is the visible proof of the born-again experience. Let's say it together, because I need this to get into our heads. And then it goes slowly down into our hearts. Okay? So, repentance is the visible proof of the born again experience. If we say we are born again, then we must have the experience of repentance. Now, repentance It's not a very popular word. In fact, it is well known that there are churches that they not preach repentance. The reason is repentance make people uncomfortable. Nobody likes to be said or be told, you need to repent. You are wrong. You need to change. However, looking at the Bible, <coughs> looking at key verses of repentance, we realize that the biblical principle about repentance is speaking out. In the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 3, we find John the Baptist. John the Baptist had a mission. His mission was to make Jesus known. And I suppose that's the same mission that we have. Today, we are also called to make Jesus known. 
Do we agree with that? Amen. Before Jesus went to heaven, he told us to make him known. John was preaching to a sinful culture. And I look around us and I see a sinful culture. Do you agree? Yeah. We also read that there were many people who were willing to go and hear John preach. And today we have millions of millions of people, especially TV or going to church, to hear the gospel. Like in time of John. But of course they had no TV. <coughs> but John was not comfortable with their understanding of following his teaching. And therefore, the first word that we read is the word repent. Now, I wish I had the time to read the whole passage of chapter 3 in Matthew. Because we will find that John did not try to sugar the preaching. He spoke it as clear and as direct as he could. And even called people brood of vipers. He even said, the axe is about to come down and cut the tree from the root. And I can say today, that same axe is about to come down very soon. John was referring to the coming of Jesus and his preaching and his sacrifice on the cross. Today, we don't speak about what's going to happen about our salvation because it is finished. Yet, there is something else that's going to happen. And that's the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. And the X is coming down. And God wants to find His church repenting and showing the fruit of the born again experience. Something else I want to say about repentance that Christians are the showcase of the fruit of repentance. Say it with me. I am the showcase of the fruit of repentance. What does this mean? It means that you are the light. <laughs> That's what it means. I made it a little bit complicated. Jesus was very simple. He said, you are the light of the world. Our life is the showcase of who Jesus is. Or so it is supposed to be. Do we agree? Yes. Praise the Lord. And unless there is repentance, it cannot happen. Once we are born again, we enter into a new family, into a new system. The Christian way of life, which is obviously opposite of what we are taught by observation and today in our schools and so on. However, brothers and sisters, keep in mind this. Repentance and the kingdom of God that we are waiting for are connected together. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 and in Matthew 4 17 we'll find John and we'll find Jesus speaking about the kingdom of God. Repentance because the kingdom of God is near. Now, we who are Pentecostal 
and even other denominations believe that Jesus is coming back for the church. Some of us believe that there is the rapture, some don't. I still believe in the second coming. We're not going into that. We don't know when the rapture is coming, if it comes, we believe that it is. Some say before the tribulation, some in the mid tribulation, the after tribulation, it doesn't matter. What sure is, it is coming. When John was speaking about the kingdom of God, he was speaking about Jesus coming to open the way to the kingdom of heaven. The door is open. It is there. And it is available for us all. Hallelujah. So that is why we call Jesus Lord, right? But many will call Jesus Lord, but they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And that causes me a problem. And the problem that causes me, the problem is this. When I look into the Bible, and I look at churches like the church of Corinth, the Revelation church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Hyakai, Philadelphia, and the others, I realize that Jesus was not so happy with what he saw in the church. Now, we are Pentecostal. And we believe that those seven churches represent time age of the church. And some of us believe also that the last church age and I can't remember the name, La Lucia. Is now the liberal church, the church of the people, the church that pleases people. And in a church that wants to please people, you will not find the preaching of repentance. You will not find the preaching saying, You need to change, you need to be committed. Christ. You need to die for yourself and your pleasures and serve Christ with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, with all your body, and with what all it has given you. Amen. Consequently, as we talk about the kingdom of God, and we talk about repentance, we see the connection. Repentance is the first step to glorification. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Believe it or not, we are tested, we are designed <coughs> to spend eternity with Jesus. We call that glorification. But it starts from repentance. When we repent, we repent from our sin and from our ungodly deeds and begin a life of faith. That's the second step. Faith. I'm not talking about faith in faith, like the word of faith. Preaching, the prosperity preaching. I'm talking about faith, which is equal to obedience. Visteo is the Greek word, which means you do what you say, you believe in. I believe that the car is manufactured in a way that if you switch on the engine and press the gas, it will move. Right? Easy. But if I go in the car and don't start the car, I'm going to remain where I am. I will not move an inch. And that's why we need to let God drive our 
life. And when God drives our life, He will take us into places that may not be comfortable for us. And I'm not talking about Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq. Who knows? So I should do it then. <laughs> We're talking about changing the way you live, the way you think. Stopping doing things which are wrong and start doing things that are right. However, our obedience is part of our faith. It is our faith. Unless we allow God and trust Him with our life, we cannot convert. Conversion. You will be one thing and becoming another. Unless you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and you obey His guidance, you will never change. You will not convert. You will remain as you are, but you change your title and say, I'm a Christian. But your life is but a showcase for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Unless we convert, then there is no proof of the born again experience. How can I show that I am born again? By wearing a t-shirt? Saying, I'm born again. Does that make you a Christian? No. By quoting the Bible to people? No. What makes you a Christian is repentance from sin and the life pleasing God, obeying God, living by or in the Spirit of God. Unless we are regenerated, we cannot be justified. Justification means that I can stand before God and God looks at me and He will see no sin in me. Not because I have become God and perfect, but because I am in Christ. Because I am in Him. Because Jesus is my mediator, we say, He has put His trust in me. And I made Him clean, I made Him white as snow with my blood. He believed in me as the atoner of sin. That alone makes us justified before God. And also, after justification, or with it, we have the issue of sanctification. The washing away of our sins. Sanctification. Sanctification, as you well know, has two levels, if I might say. The first level is instant. You are born again, you put your trust in Jesus after you repent from sin and God declares you righteous. No sin will stop you from going to heaven because you have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. But we all know that we are still sinners and we still miss it. And because we miss it, we need, we need constant forgiveness and we also need constant change of mind to stop what we're doing and do something what we're supposed to do. That is called sanctification or progressive sanctification. We purify ourselves while we are pure. That's what John says. So once we are already saved and secure in the kingdom of God, we still need to walk alive, changing our mind and our heart 
So we can serve God as He wish we serve. Amen. After sanctification, justification, and so forth, we come into the stage of glorification. That's when we die and go to heaven. Or when Jesus comes and takes us home. For us, the real glorification is yet to come. The final glorification is yet to come. But we still live in glory. Yeah. If we manage to think like Abigail said this morning, now that's hard. That's also hard, by the way. Don't grumble, she said. She should, she, she should have said that before I started driving this morning. <laughs> Did you grumble, by the way? No. Stuck in the fire? No. Ah, wow. No. Oh, yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. Yeah, right. That's why. <laughs> so, yeah. Grumbling. Complaining. Doesn't really build our spirit, does it? Afterwards, you feel, I wish I'd never done that. I would have prepared praising God, you know, as a, a prayer or something. But I'm not the holy man you think I am, or, you know, I do sins as well and miss it. And do things uh, that I tell you not to do, and things like that. Because I'm in a process. And in that process, I become like Christ. As a human being, I miss it. But you know what? Jesus said, the Bible says, I have written to you these things so that you will not continually sin. I'm just saying how the Greek verbs are. But if you occasionally sin, then you have a mediator, an advocate, before the Father to intercede for you. Praise the Lord. That's part of our glorification. That's part of the package of being a Christian. We know that once we miss it, God forgives our sins when we repent. Praise the Lord. Now, the text of my sermon, which we still are going there, is Psalm 51. Psalm 51 probably is one of the psalms that's quite well known by many of us. It's a psalm that David wrote after he was challenged by the prophet Nathan. After David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And there are phrases in that psalm which expresses, I would say very close, how we should feel when we are challenged by our sin. And I'm going to read the first six verses. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely, I was sinful at birth, 
sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be white there. That's not. I'm going to read eight as well. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. I spend most of the night thinking on this. So let's try to see the picture. We all know the story of David and Bathsheba. <coughs> we also know something about David, who was a bit of a womanizer. We also know that he had the stomach to do very bad things. Committing adultery is one thing, planning a murder is something.